Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to a special event um, run in conjunction with the Romanian Cultural Institute in London. It's called British Voices in Romania, and it's part of the Romania Rocks Festival, a literary festival celebrating Romanian-British partnerships and literature. And I'm super excited to welcome two British authors who are resident in Romania, Arabella McIntyre Brown and Mike Ormsby. Welcome. Thank you. I first started visiting Romania in the as much time as I possibly could um, going there, and particularly to a remote Romanian village in the Apatine Mountains in Transylvania. And I often dreamt of living there, buying a house and moving, but I never actually did. I was always pulled back to Britain one way or another. So I'm full of admiration and interest for two British writers who actually went the whole hog and moved full time to Romania. So first, uh, a little bit of intro. Arabella McIntyre Brown was born and raised in West Sussex. She then moved to London at the age of 19 where she worked in theatre and opera, and then moved to Liverpool, where she worked in the arts and started writing. I think that's for the first time, is that right, Arabella? Uh, pretty much, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, writing, writing for payment, yes. Yeah. And became both a journalist and an author. And she left Liverpool in 2008. And then, I think, is that the first time that you moved, that she visited Romania, about that time? I first came here in 2003 for a week's holiday. Okay. And then, yeah, and then I bought my house in 2004, but didn't move here until 2010. So okay. this is my 10th anniversary here, my 10th anniversary here. So Mike was, Mike was brought up in Liverpool and then went to university in Cardiff and became a professional musician. He worked for, he, he was part of an indie band and then also took up music journalism and then went to the BBC and worked for the World Service, which I think is how you first came to Romania, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I wanted first of all to ask, I want to ask you both in turn, really both what took you to Romania, but what made you stay? So Mike. First of all, it was journalism, was it? The, the yeah, I was working for the BBC and I came to Craiova to do a story about um, an aid group from Wales that were helping orphanages in Craiova. I came for a week uh, via Bucharest. And what made me stay? Well, what, what made me like the place was the people, first of all. Um, also the culture, I found it an intriguing place. I couldn't believe that somewhere like Romania existed so 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 close to to england just a few hours away by plane for me it was a first trip to eastern europe this was 94 so the worst ravages of communism were over but it was still pretty rough mm -hmm. and uh, people had nothing but you know as the cliche goes they would give you the shirt off their back and i really like that their mm -hmm. humor and their sense of fatalism um it was a heady mix and i couldn't really put my finger on it but i just knew i had to come back so i came back a few months later and with a full-time job and stayed full-time and Arabella, I know that it's sort of slightly longer, more complicated story. Um, but but what first hit you about Romania on your first visit that, that made you want to come back? Well, I'd been brought up on Hammer Horror movies, um, which were all filmed around Elstree, which is beach forests. And funnily enough, when I came here for a week's holiday, um, it was beach forests, and it was very like Sussex where I grew up. It felt as if I'd been transported um, back to Amberley where my uh, family had chalked, had quarried chalk for about 150 years. And it felt like home immediately, perhaps because of the, the geology, because it's limestone here, same as chalk. Um, I don't know what it was, but I just felt at home. And I came up to Magura, a village close to where we were staying, one day in a horse and cart, and it, it was, it wasn't overwhelming beauty, it wasn't like suddenly being in the, in the Bahamas or something, it was, it was a beauty that was stunning, but livable with, if you understand me, it didn't feel, feel as if I was 
an ant in the landscape, it felt that I belonged to it. And it was this feeling of home that persisted. So um, later that year, the following year, my sister died and left me enough money to, to buy a house here. To cut a very long story short, that's what I did. Um, and it took, I was only going to use it for a holiday home, but um, anyway, in 2008, it all got too much. My, we'd had five deaths in the family in 14 months and it, and it stopped me from working really. I went a bit, um, I got brain fog, you know, I couldn't think straight, couldn't work. So the only thing to do was to leave England and move out here. That seemed the, the, the only option available to me. So when people say I was brave to come out, it wasn't that at all. It was that I had a house here and it felt like going home again. Um, mm. And it offered me peace and somewhere to recover um, and find another way of life. So that's how I came and why I stayed. I wish I could turn my computer around and show you the view from my window um, because it's just exquisite. It's, you know, I'm looking at the ridge of Piazza de Crauli, uh, which is over 2,000 feet high. My house is 1,000 meters high. Um, Piazza Crado is 2,000 and something meters high. Um, the air is clean, it's peaceful, it's quiet, um, the neighbours are wonderful, it's, it's heaven on earth really. So that's why I've stayed. And when you, when you came to Transylvania, did you plan to write or did that just happen? That was the only thing I could, that was the only thing I could do. I, I wasn't... Um, I don't have the language well enough to to take a job in any other field where I'd be required to to to, to use Romanian. And I'd written, I don't know, nine, ten, twelve books. Oops, here comes a cat. I'm sorry. Um, you the tail. Let me see him. Oh, uh, this is this is Buster. I'm sorry. Um, it's very hard. Um, he. I'm sorry. I'll try and ignore him. Um, the writing was the thing I could do, sorry. Um, can you cope with the tail? We can cope, I think. This, this is life, this is life here. The cats are obsessed by the computer and the keyboard and he wants to lie on the desk. So he's lying on the desk. This is, I'm sure Mike can um, sympathise with that a little bit. <laughs> a lot. So, the writer's life, it meant that I could write from home and miraculously I can be in the mountains in a remote village and the internet was 3G in those days which was a bit of a struggle but um, I can work anywhere in the world via the internet, it's magical. Um, so writing is what I did before, um, so it was the, the obvious thing to do again and the, the story of my move and life in a Transylvanian village seemed a good story to tell so it was ready made. Which is your book, A Stake in Transylvania, from which we'll, we'll hear a reading shortly. Um, but before we, before we go on to that, um, Mike, um, you came to Romania as a journalist, but you, you didn't always stay. You, you worked in other places since you first came to Romania, is that right? In yeah, Tanzania, a lot, I think. Lot, yeah. yeah, for the last, well, between 95 and uh, until now, really, my wife Angie and I, we've been moving around the world. We've lived in about I don't know, 19, 20 countries, uh, including about seven years in Africa. So yeah, all over the place. Um, yeah. But what was as all these 20 um, also countries? It was actually it's Romania that where you've settled. Um, what, why is that? Well, I think I would echo what Arabella just said. Um, for reasons that we can't understand, that I can't understand, like her, it just felt like home very very quickly and um when arabella talked about the, the climate or the, the geography and the geology um for me i think it was the people they reminded me of of, of scousers the liverpool people arabella would probably second that because she's lived there for a while mm -hmm. um kind of quick funny sentimental tough as boots um and we i think we've often agreed that scousers are like the romanians are like the scousers of europe you know misunderstood uh, but the heart of gold <laughs> Um, so that's why the people really I uh, stayed and also my wife being Romanian um, I, I mean people say why do you stay Romanians would often say why do you stay and I say well why would I leave 
you know, it's got, a, as, as you said yourself, at the start, it's got everything you want. It has um, great people, interesting climate, fascinating culture. And I, every family seems to have one foot in, 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 in the rural areas, in the countryside. And um, as Prince Charles you know, has noted, it's like it's unchanging in so many ways. It's Transylvania, it's, it's, uh, it's like you're living in history. Um, it just has, it has its pros and cons, you know, but yeah, it's, it just goes like home. And I hope to stay. I can, I can certainly sympathize with the, with the, um, the history. So when I first came to Romania, for me, it was like stepping back in time. I thought it was the nearest I will ever get to stepping back in time. Um, and I think it's quite interesting that I, that over the years, over the decades, um, whenever I bought, I've seen lots of changes, I'm sure you have, but whenever I brought visitors um, to Romania, everyone has that same impression that it's like stepping back in time. But there's always the worry that it's going to change forever. Something precious will be lost. But as you look at travel writers over the past century, 100, 150 years, it's interesting that that was always the same thing, even going back to the 1860s, 1850s, looking at Romania as some very special, extraordinary place where you could experience traditions that have been lost elsewhere and a worry that, gosh, this is going to change forever. There are cheap imports from Western Europe a writer, I can't remember who it was, in the 1870s, soon the peasant traditions will be lost and there we were in the 1990s in worrying the same things. And I don't know if you just have any thoughts about that, that this timeless quality somehow, and this, that despite all huge changes that have happened over decades, over the last century or so, that still there's some, there's some sort of essential quality, timeless quality, I don't know what it is. Yeah, um, hopefully the, 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 the cons will get less and the pros will, will remain. You know, some of the, some of the things that uh, have changed in my experience in Romania, uh, there's less bad driving now, for example, uh, less people are smoking. Those for me are positive things. Um, so I hope that things like that will continue to change and improve. Things that, you know, I would not like to see the end of. I suppose it's kind of hard for farmers with their caruza and their, their horses, but it's nice as Arabella said to see a horse and car going down the road or to go in one. Um, it's nice learning from, from local people how to grow vines, how to plant fruit trees, how to prune fruit trees, how to make palenka. Uh, there's so much to learn here from the past and they, mm -hmm. they don't really know where they learned it, it just came down. And I think in England or in Britain, we've kind of lost that tradition. Um, yeah. You know, most of our food comes from shops. Uh, here, there's a great pride in growing your own and that's, uh, that's something that you know, appeals to us. I'm not sure that I'd agree with, with things not changing in the villages. I mean, I, that's my only experience of Romania. I, I, I wouldn't want to live in a city anymore, anywhere, ever, even Liverpool, which I love dearly. Um, but there's been massive change in the village. Not obvious to somebody who doesn't live here all the time, but there are fewer caruzas here. It, a lot of people have cars now. There were no cars in the village when I first came, except for visitors and foreigners. Um, and because of TV and mobile phones and the internet, uh, people are seeing much more of the wider world, which is a good thing. But this is also the first generation that have been going to university. And then, of course, they want to leave the village. They don't want to be up at six milking cows and mending fences and cutting hay and, and living the hard physical life that their grandparents and parents have lived, you know, going back for a thousand years. Um, so they leave the village and they go to Brasov or Bucharest or Milan or New York to find a better life and earn more money. Um, they don't want this village life anymore. They will do when they're 46 and they're, they've got small children or, you know, when they're 60 and they want to come back. It'll be too late. Their houses will have been sold and they won't have uh, the property here anymore, which, which is what most uh, countries in Europe have been through at various stages, including Britain, and Romania is going through it now. It's inevitable. Humans want change. They want more. They want different things. Um, and I don't see what is going to happen to these villages unless um, people, young people, see the value in village life and realise that they can make a living here through the internet, 
um, amongst other things, and realise that they can sort of have it all. That way the villages might change for the positive and survive. But the current way of life is going. So I'm really grateful to be here now when I can still enjoy it and, and be in the time machine that you talked about. This is like West Sussex, very rural West Sussex of the 1960s, which is what my childhood was. And I've come back to it. Um, I hope that continues, but we'll, we'll have to see. I, I, I loved uh, Mike in your Nevermind the Vampires short story. I, I can't remember which what it was, but it was about scything. So and, um, oh, scything, uh, yes. Scything, yes. And um, there was a description of the family going out scything, and the teenage girl was on her mobile phone like for, for quite a lot of the time, but she was still scything absolutely brilliantly. Yeah, and, that kind uh, of sums it up really, doesn't it? Those moments, I mean, I noticed this before. I lived in Magra for three years, where Arava is now, and I remember that most of the the the, um, the farmers used sides, manual sides. But as uh, as time moved on, more and more were buying uh, like electric, uh, petrol-driven sides, which did it a lot quicker, made a lot of noise. But that was, a, I thought, oh, things are really changing here. You know, mm. Yeah, now they're good. getting. You're seeing ancient knackered old tractors and um, electric or, or petrol-powered. Um, Lawnmowers, giant lawnmowers, um, which they work very well, but they're better than scythe. So, so because uh, scythe, scything is is an art. It's a it's oh, yeah. a dance. It's magical to watch. And very um, hard to do. Very hard to do. Very very <laughs> hard. I never <laughs> mastered that art. Even the great thing was quite hard. I thought was hopeful. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Arabella, I, I missed that. No, I was just saying. Even the raking of the hay is quite. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But I thought what was heartening, Mike, about your story was was that the girl could still scythe beautifully, but had had mastered the art of scything and being on her mobile at the same time. Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe that is a sort of hope for villagers that technology you can still have technology and sort of ancient arts and, and marry the two quite comfortably. And I wonder if um, if sort of the effect of COVID um, and people working at home more might help speed up somehow the return to the villages and I know I've spoken, know I've spoken to a couple of Romanian friends young Romanian friends um, one is an artist and the other is a, um, a tourism expert and they're both in their 30s with small children and they are separately with their families looking for places to set up an alternative way of living. So a small community, an artist community in one case and, and, a, and a sustainable living community in another in rural Transylvania. And um, they're looking for the community life again. Uh, so maybe more of those will come with COVID. They see the benefit of getting out into the country. And as Mike says, you know, the combination of scything and, and mobile phones, the, technology and tradition will will win through. I think taught, speaking of which it, it might be a good moment Mike for you to read um, an extract from your book about perhaps introducing new um, ideas okay. to, um, to villagers and and the the consequences of that the effect of that. Okay. Would, you like, would you like to say a little bit sort of to introduce your, your book a, a little bit? And, and, yes and then, um, it's it is never mind the vampires here's transylvania uh the foreword says uh for romanians and R romania files everywhere there's a quote from coleridge for thou hast pined and hungered after nature many a year in the great city pent uh, it also says this book may contain traces of nuts <laughs> including yours truly. So this story is called Stretch Your Mind. My wife is Angela and it's about, um, it's about Angela and me and a, a lady in the village. You want to offer a yoga class here in our village? Dominant Maruna seems concerned. Worry lines kink her smooth brow as she considers Angela's suggestion. We're hoping Maruna might prove a helpful eye. Well-connected woman that she is, but something is wrong. She stares at us shading her eyes from the fierce sun. It warms the church steps beneath our feet. 
but the atmosphere has turned rather chilly. Our local VIP looks increasingly ill at ease as Angela elaborates. Uh, yes, Miruna, yoga. I plan to offer an introductory class and invite local women. They've probably never had the chance to do yoga and might enjoy it. You can come too if you like. Maruna places a hand on her chest as though honored or scandalized by the invitation. Me? Why not, says Angela. My first class will be free. I'll only charge if people want more sessions just to cover rent of the hall. It's an ideal venue. I could put posters in the windows. What do you think? Maruna seems preoccupied, stressed even. Sorry, uh, posters in whose windows? The windows in the cultural center. Angela points towards a medium-sized, one-story, white-walled building nearby. The sign above the entrance says Camino Cultural, but that fat brass padlock on the door seems to have other ideas, which is probably why nothing ever happens in that place except, apparently, annual dance and traditional fisticuffs at New Year. Nevertheless, we'll try. This is why we've stopped by the church, after all. Maruna is a hard lady to track down, but this is where one can find her, about now, every Sunday. How convenient that we were passing. Miruna folds her arms, thinking it's over. She's very slim, perfect for yoga, long in the torso. Probably suffers from lower back trouble, as do I. Yoga would help. She looks at me and winces. Yoga, Don Juan Mike? Uh, yes, Don Miruna. But the thing is, we're not sure who to ask about offering a class here. So we thought we'd ask you, seeing as your husband is a local counsellor. Any idea how Angela might rent that hall? Given your contact, we were hoping that... Maruna raises her palm, cutting me off in my conjunction. Yoga is from India, I believe. Hindu, isn't it, from Angela? I believe so, yes. That's why we don't need it in our village. We have the church, you see. Maruna turns and gestures towards it with a beatific gaze. God is behind her, we are below. The big bell bongs above. I won't ask for whom, because I already know. But yoga is not about religion, says Angela. It's just gentle stretching, deep breathing, and finding yourself through meditation. We can find ourselves through prayer. Verona offers a winning smile. You lose. That's not the whole story, but that's the first couple of pages. Has a happy ending. You might be pleased to know. <laughs> No, you, no. You, you managed, tell us what that tell us a happy ending you you managed to uh, yeah we Angela manages to host a yoga class but we do it on our terrace which uh -huh. had, which had an amazing view um we could actually see our arabella's house in the distance um and the ladies came and they really enjoyed it they were farmers wives um, mostly overweight uh mostly hadn't done much exercise but they really enjoyed it and um yeah we did it a couple of times one of them got very sick afterwards. I think she'd eaten too much pork for lunch and she wasn't so feeling so good after she, she turned green. But uh, yeah, it was a, a nice experience and they wanted more. So we lost, but we won. <laughs> I do, by the way, have a, have a, a ball, a ball at New Year. I've been to one, Mike. Uh, I might, I've been to them too, yeah. <laughs> a lot of fun. They are a lot of fun, yeah. So when it's open, it's good. And it's yeah. quite quite an extraordinary thing that the that that you that you both not not only ended up in Transylvania but actually for a time lived in the same village, didn't you? Yeah, what's well, it? <laughs> yes, it's that sort of village, though, isn't it, Mike? I, I, I've had so many extraordinary synchronicities, you know, small world incidents of people coming to Magura and and discovering that I've known them in another life or you know whatever it is. It's it's one of those places everyone knows Magura. Yeah. No, that's quite. It, it was a theme that came up in in the interview. I, I'm not sure if you caught it on on Friday with um, Anna Blandiana and Fiona Sampson in, in the um, Romania Rock series, and, and there was an interesting discussion about cultural affinities and and even sort of genetic affinities of of, of um, uh, Fiona was talking about um, influences and interests that um, she had and couldn't quite pinpoint where they came from and then through finding out um, stories about her ancestors or her past and and uh, her family's past um, just oh gosh maybe that's it maybe that's why I'm attracted to this place or that place or, or whatever and uh, it's sort of interesting you have the, the Liverpool link both of you and uh, and both the same village thing 
That's, um, you live in different places now, don't you? Yes, I live near Cebu. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still in Magura. <laughs> Um, ten years and no plans to change, regardless of unless I have a catastrophic health event, um, which is difficult in this sort of village. You know, um, it is quite remote and the road isn't great. So, but I have no plans to move. Hey, Mike, I think you and in, in your um, your your uh, collection of short stories, you you changed the name of the village which yes. you lived did you change the name of some of the characters is that right all, all of them yes yes yeah yes and because, I, um, I, sorry yes go, go on go on um i did that because um all the stories are about neighbors friends and neighbors around the village and some of them would be quite easy to identify and mm -hmm. um and i don't say anything bad about people i don't think i hope not but um, you never know how sensitive people can be. And um, so I just thought it was better for everyone's privacy to change the name. Um, so the village is called Kumbaya mm -hmm. and change names of characters. And sometimes you know, I make a composite character which we have one or two people make them into one if it's too identifiable. Um, so that's why, yeah, it's to protect people's privacy really. I think that's quite a dilemma, isn't it? I, I, I know that when I was, um... The writing about the village in which I spent so much time in the Abyssane, I felt concerned about about what to say and how to say it and, and people's identities. And in fact, so much so that I ended up not depersonalizing um, the account and not being able to write about it until, until what, 20 years on, I, I think I put enough distance now um, to be able to write about things which were so personal at, at the time. But it, it, I think it, it is a dilemma, isn't it? And, and it seems that in your writing, Mike, you deal with it by, um, as you say, semi-fictionalizing account, um, but also by being quite direct um, in terms of being, um, your stories are very funny, but you laugh at yourself as well as other people. And uh, well, yeah, I think you have to. I mean, that's, that's the essence of comedy, really. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't say that they're semi-fictionalized. The stories are all 100% true. But I, as I said, I changed identities, not so much because of the, the adults in the stories, but mainly because a lot of their kids, we taught English and ukulele classes to a lot of the kids mm -hmm. in the village. And as they get older, they, they will learn to speak English, presumably, and they'll read the stories. And um, some of them are probably a bit too close to the bone. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there was, it's not, it's not all milk and honey up there. You know, they can, people can fall out big time and it can even get violent. So yeah. um, I just wanted to, you know, give them plausible deniability, let's say. Yeah. I learned that lesson yeah. from my first book, Never Mind the Balkans, Here's Romania, because people would say, that idiot in your story, he's based on me, isn't he? And I'd say, well, how, how can he be if he's an idiot? But, you know, it creates a bit of tension there. <laughs> so I thought, mm, next time, maybe be a bit more discreet somehow yeah and and did you sort of learn your lesson from that and, and be consciously more discreet and and the yes yes well yeah. but in the first book i changed people's names but still, yeah. for example my dentist great dentist but he was quite racist and quite sexist and quite xenophobic and not good things and i, I wrote a story about him and mm -hmm. i told him when i met him so if you don't if you don't you know stop saying these things i'm going to put you in my book because you know i've got to record this that's why I like to write stories. I want to record I said, the pressures of the time, how it feels to live in Romania at this time, for posterity, really, as much as anything. And I warned him, and then he read it, and he said, that dentist, he's me, isn't he? You know, he was quite angry. I said, well, I told you, but I've changed your name, so it's plausible deniability. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I learned my lesson. <laughs> As say, Arabella, have, have you, your, your stake in Transylvania is, I would you would you call it memoir it's a very very much from a very personal point of view and uh, and sort of autobiography um certainly not autobiography I, it's memoir and travel i suppose i wanted to paint a portrait of what it's like to live in transylvania really um today uh, as opposed to what people think it's like what i thought it was like before i came here um and yes, I've had the same struggles as both of you in terms of talking about people. Um, I change the names and appearances and background um, as much as I can of the people who I want to slag off because they, you know, were difficult, stroke offensive. 
um, but I've given credit where it's due to my lovely neighbours who have been so kind and understanding and tolerant because I don't go to church you know I don't I'm a bit of a hermit I don't mix in with the village and they've been incredibly tolerant and kind so I think that it's nice to give them credit so I use their real names where I can always with that in mind though that you know their children may not agree they may not find it so much of a compliment as I thought they might um, but unlike Mike who writes about people I write more about animals and birds and wildlife and the hay and the grass and the, and the wildflowers um, some people some events um, but I'm not so much of a people person so it's about clouds and insects and my wretched cats and lost dogs and um, the sheep who are the bane of my life until I put up a nice strong fence. Um, so uh, exactly the same problem and I've gone between you. Um, I've not put in some funny incidents because they are too difficult to disguise. Um, I'll have to save them for a short story another day. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm more to do with the environment, um, everything that's around me rather than just the people. So Arabella, that, that brings us um, nicely onto um, the reading that I, I think you've chosen for us today, um, which is about um, an encounter with an animal. Um, if you could um, just give us a little bit of, of context about this and, and introduce your book and, and then the extract you've chosen. Okay. Great. Well, the book, it was originally published in Romania. It was translated into Romanian and published first in Bucharest. And then I published the um, English version uh, last year. So, um, uh, I don't know if you can see yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, Transylvania. Um, I just love the colour, the cover. The, the wonderful girl um, did it for me in London. Uh, it's just, I love it. Um, not very well lit. Anyway, so um, I have chosen a little bit about sheep. Okay. An ovine paradox is that fences act like one-way valves. The sheep can easily make their silent way over or through any fence, leaping like stags if necessary, to greener greenery, i.e. the lovingly cultivated stuff in my garden but cannot pass back through the same access point without panicky bleating and wrecked fences. Bleating. Bah! My neighbouring sheep rarely bleat beyond the age of six months and don't graduate to bar. Some manage a soprano, meh, but most of them sound like old drunks throwing up, bleh. A complaint from a throat that has been subjected to cigarettes and whiskey for 50 years. But they do wear bells, which is a genuinely charming sound. The sheep have one use. In the winter, when compost freezes, the sheep get my vegetable ends. When yellow winter grass is buried under three feet of snow, the sheep greet me with passion whenever I open the back door, running pell-mell to my fence. Apple cores, carrot, cabbage and broccoli ends, of course, but these sheep have exotic tastes. Melon skins, banana skins, pineapple skin and leaves all get wolfed down with gusto. They don't stick to my menu, they forage. The week I moved into the house, I bought a hanging basket of pink begonias from the market and hung them on the balcony outside the front door. In those days, there was no fence, but the balcony rail is seven feet above, above the grass. Safe, I thought. Ha. The following morning, there was a scant inch of stalk neatly severed, sticking up from the soil, and one sad petal lying on the grass below. No sheep actually had a smoking begonia hanging from its lips, but they were lurking to see if I'd hang out any more pretty breakfast for them. You bastards, you woolly bastards, I screamed pointlessly. You're Sunday lunch in overcoats. I've got mint grey on the back. Hey, yay. They just stared and chewed their begonia cud, insolent hooligans. The word sheepish is seriously misused. To say someone looks sheepish implies they look a bit shamefaced, rather embarrassed. Fooey. Sheep don't coexist with the concept of shame. They are all brazen, insolent, remorse-free, 
housebreaking, begonia stealing bastards. <laughs> so, I hope you can. <laughs> <laughs> I hope Magda can make something out of that, I'm sorry. That's great, thank you. The bit I didn't read was a bit about coming back, uh, dumping stuff in the compost bin, coming back to find five sheep inside my hall, standing on my grandfather's Persian carpet, all looking at me saying, where's my Outrageous. But now I have a six foot fence, chain, <laughs> chain link metal fence. Feel that wall. <laughs> Build that wall. Yes, and the sheep will pay for it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I've got mouse now. Mouse is another cat. You can see the tail. Of it. Mouse. Um, this, this is a permanent fact of life. Mike, I don't know if you've managed to, to have a um, an animal-free study, but I haven't. Um, no, I, uh, cats like to walk all over my computer, <coughs> my, my little keyboard. Yeah, anything new? Uh, oh, what's this? Mouse is obsessed with my keyboard. She 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 knows she's not allowed to lie on it, but she'll lie and sort of roll over so that something touches a keyboard. You know, a good way to get rid of them is to play some kitten videos on YouTube. Some crying kittens. Oh no, they're not bothered by that at all. I've tried that. No, they if if there's a really distressed sound, one of them will look up and go. Oh no, and they, they no, they don't care. It doesn't work. Pass it, pass it, run. Kids, who needs kids? <laughs> So, um, I think I'm just quite conscious of, of, of time, and I, I wanted to ask you you've, um, that you've both been extremely modest about your um, Romanian language skills, um, but clearly you have some Romanian in order to get by and to communicate, to exist on a day to day basis. Um, but both of you um, write about everyday life about the people you see, the encounters you have. And I think Mike in particular, conversations, conversations you have which are clearly um, taken place in Romanian. And I just wondered if as, as Romanian it's not, you're, you're not bilingual, so there's clearly, um, and, and you're in some ways anxious about your Romanian. Um, do you think that sort of other senses take um, take over, but if you if you know you don't understand exactly what people are saying, that you maybe observe um, facial expressions more, or become more aware of how people sort of exist in, in relation to you, using other sense of, li of not just listening but observing. And um, <laughs> so it's for both of you actually. I just I'm quite yeah. Um, my my problem is that I've got quite a good accent, I'm told. Um, <laughs> so people think I speak far better Romanian than I actually do, <laughs> um, which can get me into trouble. But um, yes, of course, speaking with the words you speak is only part of the message you give out. So tone of voice and body language and so on all are massive clues to what somebody is saying, thank God, um, because uh, one of my neighbours speaks very quickly. Um, and I catch, I don't know, one word in six, <laughs> but I can get the gist and I can laugh in the right places because of the clues that I'm getting from, from tone of voice and body language. Um, my downhill neighbour speaks slowly um, and is always aware that I'm useless at her language, um, that I, she, she talks to me like an idiot, thank heavens. I mean, not rudely, she mm -hmm. talks to me as if I don't have the language, which is fair. Very helpful. So, She's incredibly helpful. So, and, and of course, we only talk about village things. So when I go to the city and meet non-English speakers, I get into trouble very quickly because city talk is very different to village talk. And I bet you've got fantastic vocabulary for trees and flowers. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, yes, I <laughs> wildlife and nature. I, I know a lot of trees, wow. and birds and animals and things, more than the Romanians do locally. You know, I, I say, you know, ask them about this wildflower and they're going, what's that? <laughs> and do you pick up, is there a lot of dialect? Do you, do you find that you pick up dialect words? I remember when I was on the Abu I unknowingly, I just started to use dialect words and then my friends who came to see me from Bucharest would laugh so much and say I had this really thick Abu accent and was speaking absolutely <laughs> weird words for mud 
or snow or whatever. Okay. <laughs> the, the, one, the, the one that I can think of is that there's a, there's a, um, a fruit here called Corcoruche, um, mm -hmm. which is in English, it's a cherry plum. In France, they call them Mirabelle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and Corcoruche is the tree, but you also call them Zarzare. Mm -hmm. But in Magura, for some unknown reason, they're called Zarzine, Zarzine, um, which nobody knows except the people here. So Bukharest then come up and they and they and I talk about chutney that I've made from Zarzin, which is delicious. A, they don't know what chutney is, and B, they don't know what Zarzina is. You know, <laughs> um, that's, that's so an example. Of it, oh, it's delicious! It's delicious. I know I would love some, yeah, I'm saying that's a bad thing. <laughs> so how about you, Mike, in, in terms of language? And... Um, I keep my ear well tuned for how people speak, mm -hmm. because I think, um, you know, there are various ways to describe a character or to present a character on the page. Obviously, the physical description, um, the way they move, um, but also the way they speak. So I carry a little notebook with me a lot of the time. This little thing, it's tiny. I'm Very tiny. I was oh. jotting in it and um, because it's, it's the way people speak can be, can be very indicative of their character, the way they, they will omit words or use dialect. Like Arabella, my Romanian is not great, but I think we both understand enough. We may not, 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 not be able to speak it very well as far as locals are concerned, but we understand enough probably to, to know what's being said and what's going on. So um, I kind of keep my ear open for that. Um, I picked up three gypsy ladies one time, gave them a walk, gave them a, they were on a walk pick, picking mushrooms and I gave them a lift in my car. And as soon as I got in the car, as soon as I got in the car and started speaking in Romanian, I knew I had a story because the way they were speaking and how quickly they were speaking, the questions they were asking me, uh, it, was, uh, it was quite an experience. And um, so I got home quickly and typed it up as soon as I could. And then went back to it and, you know, crafted the story later. But yeah, dialogue for me is very important. And maybe because, because our, our, our language is not so great, maybe we do compensate by looking and listening and, and, and smelling and keeping our eyes open like that. I mean, I think any writer does that really. But perhaps if you don't speak the language that well, your other senses do compensate, as you suggested. Oh, indeed. Um, sadly, we're, we're coming to the end of, um, of, of this session. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, um, one question about the different experiences that you have in terms of Arabella living as a single woman in Romania, which you talk about in your book, and Mike, you're married to a Romanian. And I'm just quite interested in, in the sort of different experiences that you've had as, as a result of that. Um, I'm also um, just thinking about one of your stories, Mike, in which you talk about how unusual it is for a woman to live on her own, and one particular woman in the village who is thought of as a witch. Yeah. Um, because she's, <laughs> she's there on her own in quite an isolated, and keeps herself to herself. And um, just sort of thinking about that, and okay. Arabelle as a it's a parallel you know, experience. You're having a wife. Yeah, that makes a difference, I suppose, because you know, I've got family here, let's say. My in-laws are here, and they've been part of my life since 95. So I've witnessed up, up close how they live. They live out in the sticks near Braille in a tiny, tiny village, smaller than Magra. Um, and that's been an interesting experience. I remember there were three ladies out the back making soap in a huge cauldron. It looked like this, you know, the opening of Macbeth, um, soap from pig fat and herbs and stuff. And, Little things like that, you know, you feel privileged because you get to see them because you've got, uh, I guess, you know, a Romanian spouse. Mm -hmm. um, as regards, has it helped also having a translator with you? Sure, you yeah. Think it it's helped you in terms of acceptance or not necessary. You're still seen as an odd, sort of British yeah, character. Well, I, 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 in my first book, Never Mind the Balkans, there's a story about a funeral that I attend in Angela's parent, parents' village. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard some locals talking about the stranger. And I said to Angela, oh, so uh, it's nice that they noticed me. And they, what, what were they saying about the stranger? And she said, no, you're not a stranger. They were talking about the guy from the next village who came to the funeral. You're an extraterrestrial. <laughs> 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 uh, 
as regards the lady who lives on her own in Margaret, it's not yes. Arabella. It was um, it was a lady who collects mushrooms. Arabella may know of her. No, um, I wasn't suggesting it's Arabella. I know you weren't. <laughs> I'm saying it. Just, <laughs> um, sh and she uh, she gets a bit of stick sometimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's as tough as old boots, you know. And she gives as good as she gets, and she doesn't mm -hmm. care. But I think that's you know going back through time. That's where the idea of witchcraft came from. I think it was often. Oh. You know, they didn't, the village elders didn't pick on the local weightlifter or the blacksmith. They would always be the vulnerable old lady who had nobody, who was a bad, a bad person who had to be burned at the stake. You know, they pick on uh, an easy, on, on easy target, let's say. And that whole culture, the whole idea of witchcraft, um, there's a lot to do with, I think, single women, the power of a single woman, um, which seeks nicely into Arabella. Let's go. <laughs> well, I'm the right age, too. I'm 62 now. I was 52 when I came. Um, and I've got cats and I wear a hat um, so you know and I, and I keep myself to myself I don't go to church um, so you know as I said they're incredibly tolerant they could have made my life extremely difficult and I'm sure that I'm thought of as an extraterrestrial <laughs> I will never be a local um, I mean it's the same in Sussex it's the same yeah. in villages the world over you know yeah. You're never a local unless three generations of your family have come from here. So oh, that's that's three dozens. <laughs> Get off. Sorry, I'm being interrupted. Off. Um, but my experience of um, the kindness of my neighbours um, has been has made it possible to be here without them. You know, they if the water goes off or I have a burst water main or my chimney falls, whatever it is. I just run to the neighbours and say help, and they come and help me. You know, it's 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 part of the DNA of, of the rural Romanian. I'm sure in the cities too, but less so. Um, that they look after you. You know, it's they are um, bred and brought up it's to make sure that your neighbours are okay. You know, even if you don't like them, you make sure they're okay. Um, so in the first hard winter, I had a guy from right the other side of the village trekking through you know, a metre and a half of snow, it was a hard winter. Um, and he had a, a rucksack full of food on his back that he brought for me because I, you know, we, couldn't, we were all stuck. Um, and he had slanina and milk and cheese and apples and all sorts. And he brought it out of sheer kindness. Um, sadly, he died this year, went to his funeral. Um, but you know the the kindness of the people here, as as Mike said earlier, is is uh, is notable. Uh, even if they think that I'm prime gossip material, you know everything that I do is good for gossip. Oh, have you seen what she's done? Um, that I have cats in the house, that I love animals, that I occasionally tick them off about kicking a horse or whatever. Try and explain. Um, the weak and vulnerable thing, yes, I, of course I know I am, but I've had a couple of encounters with dodgy individuals um, where I eventually lost my temper um, outside the house. So the short Anglo-Saxon words that I was uttering in their direction um, were literally broadcast. You can hear everything. Um, had Mike still been here, I'm sure he'd have heard it from his end of the village. So I think the word's gone out that I'm not that soft a touch, <laughs> even though I'm single, old, and foreign, um, and an idiot. I'm not entirely a pushover. <laughs> so between that and, and the kindness, the natural kindness, I'm, I've done okay. So from that point of view, I think rural Romania is um, a much more desirable place to be. It rocks, Roman. It rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so just to, to round to round off on that, um, writing future or current writing projects. Um, Arabella, um, I'm writing the sequel um, to Steak, which is A spell in Transylvania. It's a uh, story and the transition for. Um, I thought it was an interesting year to write about, and then of course COVID arrived, which made it a different book. So it's a mixture of day-to-day -day life here, um, occasional ranting about uh, Trump and and Brexit because I can't write sensibly about it. Uh, memories, things that that um, occur in my past. Um, it's, it's, it's a it's a mix, and and then. Um, 
a delve further into my state of mind because I've been quite depressed this year, um, as have so many others. Um, so I'm just trying to dig down into that because the, the, the mental health aspects of the in stake in Transylvania was the thing that prompted the most feedback, particularly from Romanian women. Um, they were astonished that I'd been so open about it and grateful because until they read my book, they thought they were the only one feeling whatever way they felt. So on that basis, I thought it was worth doing a bit more digging and being a bit more open. It's scary. Um, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing or if anybody will read it, but that's now. Next year, we'll see. I'm still writing children's books too. So. Good luck with that. And Thank you. Mike? I'm working on a musical with a couple of theatres at the moment. Um, so that involves uh, writing songs, recording them at home, and then um, marrying it with a script. Um, that was hopefully to come out in 2021, but then COVID hit, so who knows, we'll see. Um, some more short stories, I think. There are some stories that I've gathered from my travels around the world. For example, we were in Tanzania recently and we had uh, Maasai warriors as our security guards. And they were, the stories they were telling me were just fascinating about how and why they hunt lions as a, as a, as a, a week to passage as, as a teenager. Um, and stories from other countries, I think. So yeah, when time, when time is, is right, I'll get around to them. But from the moment I'm working on, on a musical project, which uh, I hope will see the light of day, see the darkness of night one, one, one time. <laughs> Well, thank you both very much indeed. Best thank of luck you. with your writing project. And I awesome say, stay happy, Romania rocks for all of us. Thank absolutely. you. And you too. Look forward to the, to, yeah. the, to the next meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully in Transylvania. Yes. Best yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>